everyone. I'm Carter. This is Making It Up. So this is a show where I talk to other authors. We have a nice chat. And at the end, we make up a story together. Uh, so today's episode was pretty cool. Today I talked to uh, Julie Clark, whose 2020 thriller, The Last Flight, just completely blew up. Blowing up is probably not the right term, using flight. It, uh, it took off. Her novel took off totally. It sold a lot of goddamn copies is what I'm talking about. So it instantly became a New York Times and USA Today best-selling novel. So that's just awesome. Um, so we talked about like what it's like for her to juggle being a writer and also being a fifth grade school teacher. And I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with getting up at 345 in the morning every day. Uh, Julie also shares some just tremendous insight about how she navigates the publishing industry, as well as how she maintains a healthy work-life balance as a single parent. Um, and we also get to talk about one of my favorite things to do in writing, which is making a character disappear off the grid, which has a lot to do with her novel, The Last Flight, and the research that goes into figuring that out. Um, and at the, at the end of our chat, we make up a pretty surreal kind of circus-based story that involves lots of mirrors. Um, so anyway, it was a lot of fun. Hope you enjoy this is my conversation with Julie Clark. How are you? I there know. I am. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Do you have a little setup there? Look at you. I do have a setup. I've got books and a microphone and everything. Yeah. So tell me about your setup. Where are you? I am in my office attached to the garage where I do most of my teaching and working. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Now yeah. you're, you're in uh, California, right? Uh -huh. Los Angeles. Uh, where, where in Los Angeles? Uh, Santa Monica area. Okay. But uh, so, and you, you grew up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was that like? You Growing know? up in Santa Monica? Oh my God. <laughs> Santa Monica is such a nice place. Yeah, uh, it was great. You know, Santa Monica is different now than it used to be a long time ago. When, when I was growing up here, it was a small little sleepy beach town. Yeah. Um, we have a main street that goes down from the east side of Santa Monica to the west side called Montana. And it was just a very, um, tons of gas stations, and PM, mom and pop shops, totally. bakeries, yeah. things like that, a pharmacy. Um, and now it's like paparazzi central, you know, so it's all high end boutiques and, you know, restaurants that have like really crowded seating and, you know, two little scallops on a plate and they charge you $30 for it, that kind yep. of thing, you know, so it's very different. It's, are you it's pretty like Hollywood now. Are you pretty rooted there though? Like, do you feel yeah. like it might be a place that you would leave at some point or? No, I'm You're pretty all in. good here. I'm all in. I mean, there's, there, I think, I think of Santa Monica as two, two different layers. There's the top layer. That's the Hollywood and, you know, you know, the, the rich, the rich people who move here to be in the industry. And then there's this subculture of people who have been here forever. We've always been here. We're not going anywhere, the locals. And we just kind of operate separately. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah so I left and then, you know, went to New York for school and then kind of lived all over the place. And whenever I would come back and visit LA, it was, it was almost kind of insufferable because I had been away from it. And then just, it was almost, it was too much, too many. I mean, yeah. Santa Monica is different. Santa Monica is a little bit more insulated perhaps, but uh, um, I love going back there, but, but LA is, is, is tough for me to envision rooting down again. Yeah, I mean, my kids are going to school here. My parents are here. And okay. so, you know, we're here for the long haul, probably, you know, and it's one of those things where if you consider moving away, you know, selling your house, and if you move out of the area, you'll never be able to move back. I mean, that's yeah, totally. <laughs> the fundamental truth about the property values here. So yeah. you really need to be ready to make a break forever because there's no coming back. So that's also sort of what will keep me here, probably. And the yeah. weather, which yeah. I keep. Well, I'm in Colorado and we definitely have a good number of people from California coming in just, you know, for various different reasons, but, yeah. you know, and I moved here from Miami, so <laughs> 20 years ago, so I'm, I'm no different. And then, and then growing up, um, what did, what did your, um, parents do? My mom sold real estate mm -hmm. and my dad was a CPA. Okay. So, so the, 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 the writing link didn't come directly from them. 
No, no, not at all. Um, Can you yeah. trace that somewhere? Or not at least the really. creativity? I mean, I, th I would say that my brother and I are both very creative. He's a comic book artist. Oh. And so he does. Does he let you say comic book or do you have to say graphic novels? Well, they're different. So comic books are comic books and graphic right. novels are comic books in long form. So he's truly a comic book artist. Yes. Although oh. he's written a couple graphic novels as okay. well. Um, Very but cool. yeah, so he does, he works for DC and Marvel and does all that, but he lives in wow. Japan. So he's, <laughs> he's a whole different life. Yeah. He's so, so he's been, you know, he's very creative and, um, and I'm very creative as well. So it's not really a surprise, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. I, I find it so interesting because some people it's like, oh, I fell in love with books because I was reading since I was five and other people like myself, it's just, I kind of just started doing it later in life and I don't yeah. really quite know totally where it came hey. from. Yeah, no, that was the same for me. I mean, I am an avid reader. I'm always reading, constantly reading. I think my kids' first words were put the book down. <laughs> um, and so I just have always, like, that's been my MFA really is just my reading life. I don't have a graduate degree in creative writing. I don't, I don't have any degree in creative writing. Right. I have a degree in graphic design though. <laughs> but um, yeah. And so it just, it, it, I came to it later in life. I probably didn't start writing seriously for publication until I was maybe 43 or so. Yeah. 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 So, you well, know. My, uh, my degree is uh, a bachelor of sciences in uh, hotel administration. So right. <laughs> I, I didn't take a, a single English or literature class in college, not one. Exactly. Uh, and so, I, so it's, it's, it, it's an interesting conversation to have you as somebody who's like, okay, I'm writing now. Am I doing it right? How do I know what to do next? How do I publish a book? Where does it all, cause you know, I, I was 33 when I started writing, but you know, I wrote this book and then I didn't know anything about what the next steps were. So I was just. Yeah furiously tons googling Google. yes tons of googling <laughs> right right and, it, and, it, and it's so funny now when people come i don't know if this happens to you but they'll ask for your advice like well how do i get an agent how do i like well just get on the internet that's Google. what i had to do there's yeah. so much information out there i mean i always want to be really generous with advice only because um i didn't really know who to turn to myself right and so but, but at the same time you know, as far as finding an agent and finding a publisher, like you just kind of have to do it one step at a time, you know, there's no yeah. shortcut. And what happened for me and the way that it happened for me won't be the way that it happens for somebody else because it's Absolutely different not. for every single person, almost like a fingerprint. It's just, there's no one path and you can't even measure by any kind of metric as to how you're doing. Am I close? Am I, you know, well, if this happened for you, then maybe if that happens for me, then X, Y, or Z. And then you just, it's just, it's just not. You're a hundred percent right. And it's yeah. all about, I think, setting individual goals and what, what would make you feel successful. And, and to yeah. me, it was like, I, you know, I wrote this book and I was embarrassed that I had done it in a way I hadn't really told anybody I did because I didn't know what I was right. doing. And so my, okay. my one goal was like, I'm going to try to get an agent because that would be one person who's not related to me, who is willing to take a risk on me. And to me, that would, that was a massive measure of success. Same, same exact thing for me. I didn't tell anybody I was writing a book. <laughs> Everybody's writing a book, right? Like, why right. am I different? Why am I special? Well, what if you don't finish the book? And well, in three that, years, they're going I, to say, well, how's that yeah, book going? Like, <laughs> exactly. I didn't want the questions of like, how's the book, how's the book, right? And I mean, I really initially started to write because I needed to pay for preschool. Like that's really expensive. You know, preschool is so expensive out here in California. Yeah. It's basically the rent for a one bedroom apartment in Santa Monica. And so I needed money. And um, that's, it's kind of a silly joke now because by the time I actually got any money from my writing, my kids were 12 <laughs> and nine. You right. know, right. It's probably not the best advice to say, well, I need so, money. So I decided so if, to become an yeah. author. <laughs> if you need money, don't, don't think you're going to get it when you need it. I mean, it's great, but yeah. So yeah, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't want anybody to know. I didn't want anybody to ask. And I did feel like if I can get an agent, then I can start telling people because that sort of, for me, was sort of a measure of legitimacy of like, yeah, I'm not just some person who's, you know, writing a book in my free time. Like I'm, I'm a serious writer and I have a chance of actually getting published. Right. So at that point I did start 
And people were shocked. They were like, you're writing a book? You're kidding me. And it's like, yeah, and I already have a literary agent. So, you know, yes, right. I'm writing a book. And it was very weird to start like sharing that. Yeah, yeah. totally. Well, and then, you know, years, years down the road to even get to the point to tell, because I think you and I both have other jobs as well to, mm -hmm. you know, to meet somebody at a cocktail party and they say, what do you do? Yeah. To me, if I ever said I'm a writer, I felt like a fraud. Um, and, and I, and I, you know, after five or six books were out, I'm like, okay, I can at least include that. Right. <laughs> and right. maybe I'll even lead with it every now and then, but. Right. But, it's funny. I don't really either. I don't really, I mean, when people say, what do you do? I say, I'm a teacher, you know? Yeah. And every now and then, like one of my kids will be like, well, you also write books. And it's like, yeah. Oh yeah. And I'm an author too. And then they, yeah, well, have you written anything? Yeah. And then, and then. Yes. It's funny. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, I think, I think a lot of authors have just, and uh, just, I don't know, a self-confidence issue. I mean, everyone, you, you can be so proud of what you've written, but also so scared of what you've written. And I think that kind of parlays itself into how you present yourself to the world as well. I know a lot of writers who are very just, you know, almost embarrassed by their works, even though they're ferociously proud as it, of it as well. So how did you, so what was, so you went to, but just backing up a little bit. So uh -huh. you went to college yeah. And, and what did you study? Graphic design. Graphic design. That's yeah. right. So you're going to be a graphic designer, right. which is a, which is a valid, good <laughs> career choice. You know, lots of good jobs that, that give you a steady paycheck and insurance mm -hmm. and you, and you, and you graduated and then what? I did that for maybe nine months and realized that I wasn't really cut out for sort of the cutthroat design firm. Huh. environment i didn't like the competition this was like in los it. angeles where you were working no this was up north in northern california where i went to college and the design firms that i was applying to be a junior designer at um were just incredibly um cutthroat and i just remember thinking to myself like i'm not really sure i have the stomach for this yeah. and, and i think that also i had some doubts as to my abilities as to whether i could really compete talent wise as well um I'm a hmm. decent artist but I don't I my brother's the talented artist right yeah. like we're just different different and I and I majored in graphic design because I liked art and um maybe shouldn't have shouldn't have done that I'm I'm a very I'm a very um capable artist I would say but I wouldn't say that the creativity and the artistic side like the visual arts comes naturally to me you know yeah and maybe so the passion I, wasn't quite there as yeah, well I just didn't feel that that was where I really wanted to be and so I decided to go back I worked in athletics for a while as I was sort of just hmm. okay well I'll do that and I worked in the athletic department at Berkeley um for four or five years and then kind of realized mm, athletics isn't really what I want to do either I was doing fundraising which was interesting and then I decided I wanted to go back to school and get my teaching credential. And so that's what I did. I went to, I went to school, dropped it, quit my job and went to school full time for a year to get my credential. And then when it came time to find a job where I wanted to be, I knew that I wanted to go somewhere where I was willing to settle for a while. So, so it was really a decision. Do I want to stay in Northern California or do I want to move back home to Southern California? And I really knew that the next step in my life would be you know, having kids and starting a family. And I wanted to be closer to my parents for that, which right. has been a lifesaver for me. Best decision I ever made was oh. to come home closer to my parents because they're very, very involved in my kids' lives. And I'm just oh. so, so lucky to have them. I mean, yeah. they're just, it's, it's a, it's an all hands on deck kind of situation. So what uh, grades are your kids in? Uh, ninth and sixth. Okay. Yeah. A so, bit mine. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of what brought me back home. So did you know when you were getting your um, teaching credentials, what you wanted to teach and what ages you wanted to teach? Yeah. I mean, I, I have an elementary credential so I can teach anything from K to six and I teach fifth grade and I've been in fifth grade for 23 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And, yeah. and, and just in, in a public school system or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you so just I'm love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's a great job. It's fun. It's, it's engaging. It definitely, whatever, whatever problems I'm having or frustrations I'm having with the writing and publishing world of which there can be many, mm -hmm. um, going to school every day and 
sitting with kids and working with kids, like you just forget it for six hours, it's gone. And by the time you leave and you're like, oh yeah, I was really upset about that. You're like, oh, oh, well, you know, you just don't care, you know? It's, it's an interesting, uh, you know, cause one of my, so my whole writing career is based up on goals, right? And so I'm very goal oriented and that, and now it feels like kind of the next goal would be, Hey, I want to be able to write full time. Cause it always feels like this great, yeah. you know, yeah. pearly gates kind of a thing. And yeah. there are times where I'm like, I don't know if that's so great. I don't, you know. I don't think it is. <laughs> I mean, I, I have had stretches of time where I've not been working and thought, this is going to be great. I can write, you know, it'll, it'll really give me a feel for, you know, writing full time. And, and the truth of the matter is I don't actually write any more like time-wise right. than I do when I'm working. And there's a whole lot of snacking that happens that, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not really inclined to want to do long-term. The other thing too, is that I just don't think I ever want to depend on uh, a sale or an advance or royalties right. to pay my bills right? You know, or to support my kids. You know, my kids are heading into college in the next few years and um, I'm going to have to pay for that. And I just, I, I think it would be stifling creatively. You know, I'm a single mom, so I'm right. the only income in the right. house. Right. And so to not have anything to fall back on would be really scary. And I like health insurance too. So yeah. we have very... We have very parallel stories because yeah. yeah. I'm a single dad and yeah, it's the same thing. And it's, and I, I think you still have to really enjoy that other work, right? Cause it, cause it's yeah. not like, no, uh, I mean, absolutely. I mean, there are days where I'm like, oh, I can't wait till I retire, you know, and it's seven right. years, seven years. I've got seven years in my head and I'll hit 30 years teaching and I'll be, you know, ready to retire. And, yeah. Yeah, and I'll get enough for my pension that will, you know, cover my bills and then book money will be extra and that will be great. Right. You know, that would be great. Yeah. Well, that's, that's tremendous. Um, mm-hmm. So what was the, what was the impetus for the first thing that you wrote? You said, you, you know, like me, you were older when you started doing that. What was, what was the catalyst for it? Um, mostly I just wanted to see if I could do it. You mm-hmm. know, I just. So you'd been thinking about the idea of writing a book for yeah. some time. Oh, long time. I mean, oh, okay. years and years and years. It was, you know, it's always been something that I've wanted to do or th- you know, every time I read a good book, I would have this feeling of like, I want to do that, you know? Yeah. But I, I didn't even know really where to start. And then I just kind of woke up one day and realized like, why not just start, Right. you know, like instead of trying to figure out where to start, just start. And so I wrote a book. It took me, I don't know, four or five months to draft. And then I spent several months revising it and started looking for an agent and, queried many, many agents and, um, didn't, didn't go anywhere. And then, so I thought, okay, well, I'll write another one. And so I wrote another book and that one was the one that ended up getting me my agent. And that was my debut, the ones we choose, which came out in 2018. And, um, yeah. And I just kind of, you know, with writing, it's sort of, you just do the next thing, you know, that you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. So my, my first book got me an agent after 75 rejections, but my first three books didn't sell. Mm-hmm. And halfway through that first year of going through those rejections, mm-hmm. I started to panic and be like, you know, shit, my agents, why wouldn't she drop me if this doesn't sell? Like why there, you know, so let yeah. me quickly write another one. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, you got into a routine where, and then, and then you start to read the rejections and you're like, okay, I can really learn from this. This is like helpful information of why these editors are reading my book and writing like four paragraphs of why they want it. That's amazing. I didn't didn't really see a lot of, I asked my agent not to pass it on unless it was valid, like that we could do something with. So like with the last flight, um, you know, we submitted it to many editors and got some rejections early on. And I asked her, like, are there any, is there any like consensus, like yeah, a common theme of rejection? Same, yeah. Same thing? And she was like, no, they're all over the map, which means that it's just a personal, personal taste thing. And we got lucky with the last fight. We ended up with four houses being interested in it. And so yeah, all right. the source books just swooped in and said, Goodbye, everybody. Yeah. Are you is 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 Anna your editor? I, I or no, Shana. Yeah. 
Shay not Shay not. Okay. Yeah, I've been with um, Anna for four books now, and they're I mean source books. I could go on and on and on about, but um, I've been with a lot of different publishers, and and the way that they approach, and because I'm a very I'm also a data and analytics guy. So yes. the way that they approached that yes. in, in a very opaque industry where a lot of people are very fluffy about numbers and we don't really yeah. know what works. We don't really analyze source books. We'll take a look at like, this is what has been proven to work. This is what we think right. here's. Yeah. So I, yeah. I have a lot of respect for that. Um, yeah. They, they've been right. fantastic. Yeah. So, so now how, so how, much do you write in a day typically what is your what is your schedule i am up at about 3 45 every morning Jeez. um i write from about four to six or six thirty mm-hmm. usually um and then i'm done for the day yeah already. i mean i actually i'll have weekends are a little different i'll sleep in um i slept until five today and <laughs> got some work done. I have a little bit more work I want to do this afternoon, but I generally try to do my writing work first before I do anything else. Because if I don't, I have a tendency to not want to go back to it, or I have a tendency to be really bitter about having to sit down and work, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, a two to two and a half hour block is substantial in my yeah. opinion. Like there yeah. are people who sit down for four or five hours and I don't have, you know, even if I didn't have the other, the, other gig I don't think it, you'd have to build that muscle to be yes. able to do that I mean I think it depends on the stage you're in though like when I'm doing sure. it for my editor it's four or five six hours a day on the weekends for sure yeah. um or if it's on a vacation if I've got if I'm trying to do those revisions but usually by the time I'm at a place where I'm doing revisions for my editor I know the story and the characters the plot set everything is there's not a lot of like thinking to do Right. That actually does happen when I'm not sitting at my desk. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, but it's exhausting. I, any part of it can be exhausting because you are, you are so into a task that is either commanding your creative uh, abilities or just the, you know, sitting and yeah. staring at words on the screen. Yes. It's, it's, it's exhausting. I'm, I'm, I do about an hour a day. I write at five o'clock in the afternoon and I grab, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a, a martini and I, I have a little place that I go in my house then. And I don't really think about my stories at all until I sit down and then yeah. I'm just in a world and I can be hyper productive and then come out of it and then feel accomplished. So yeah. 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 It's, a, I mean, it's interesting. I think- yeah, I, I think that people have a misunderstanding that authors are at their desks for six to eight hours every day and that in order to write a book, you really need to have that kind of time. You really don't. You really don't. And actually, yeah. it's counterproductive. If you're trying to sit at a desk for four to six hours to be creative, um, generally, maybe the first few hours will be really great. And then the last several hours will be awful. Like right. just, stuff that you're going to have to really heavily read right. most you're, likely. It's not going to be useful anyway. Yeah. You know? And I generally have a sense of when I've hit that, I, when I've hit that mm-hmm. moment, you know, like when I'm writing and I'm thinking to myself, like, mm, this is really something I need to do tomorrow. Yeah. And it's not procrastination. It's really like, that's when my brain is going to be fresh again. And when I'll have some more ideas about it. And Right. You know, I love, I actually love, you know, writing and then stopping right as it's about to get great. <laughs> You're like, mm-hmm. I can't wait to write this scene. Yeah. Stop. And like, now I've got this tomorrow as my I'm launching to, yeah. rather than like, oh, I've got to do all those edits again. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it, it, everybody's different for sure. And you feel like, you know, so I always ask myself or try to analyze myself. And I think we're, we're similar in terms of how we learned. Yeah, how do you how do you get better as a, as a writer? And you know, you you've written and once you write enough manuscripts, you kind of feel like okay, I know what I'm doing, but how do I get better? You know, I don't have we don't have classes that we went to, or we're not right. taking classes. Hey, you do you, do you yeah. just look at what you've written and and just you you get a sense of okay, now I see how I just organically get better, or do you? Th- I think some of it is organic. I think some of it is, you know, building a muscle. You certainly get faster at it. For sure. More efficient, I would say, if not faster. Um, But I think, I think the way you get better is to read. I think, I think just reading widely, not just inside of your genre, but across 
genres, I think helps. Um, finding people, whether you know them as authors or not, to be your mentors in a way, to study them and to take their books apart and yeah. to really deconstruct them is something that you can do on your own. And it's, you know, not free. Well, I guess it could be free if you go to the library. Um, but, but I think that that for me is how I grow, you know, I could take classes. I mean, but I don't, I don't have time to take classes really. That's, but maybe someday I would, so, I, certainly, yeah. I certainly don't want to like rule that out, but it's, it's not, you know, I'm a big believer in like opportunities present themselves when you're ready for them yeah. and writing is very much that way. And so solutions and lessons and ideas will come if you just let them you know you're absolutely right i mean you could you could teach classes too you know it, it, yeah because i'll look at classes and i'll think well they might suggest this is the way that you write a book and i'll feel like well i've kind of done yeah. that and whether i do it your way or not i kind of feel like i have a way that works for me I yeah. want to know, you know, the small little things that I can improve upon or just feel like every book, like I'm, I'm getting stronger and, and you know, faster and that kind of a thing. I think a good editor will do that for you. Yeah. You know? I think, I think having not just your editor at your publishing house, but also an outside developmental editor that you work closely with that understands what you're trying to do. And those kinds of people can also push you forward in a way. And, you know, just having a really solid stable of critique partners um, yeah, helps. totally. And, and, and if they're within the industry, they can also help you. We've, I've talked about this with some other authors on this podcast about, you know, your editor will also have other thoughts in mind aside from the story. They're, they're thinking about your name, your brand, yeah, you know, potentially packaging even early on, like, does yeah. this all work and something that you might not have had front and center of mind as you were writing and that's always helpful too, because it, I mean, yeah. my age, my agent's great at that. It's like, well, you know, your last four books featured this. Now you're trying to do this. I don't know if that is the best decision. Right. And that doesn't mean you have to take that advice, but it's great to hear because you might not be aware of it. Um, the further along you get, you know, within yeah. whatever it is that you're writing. So, um, and then, yeah, the, you know, Anna at source books for editing, like I've never had, I don't think I've ever had a large suggestion that I've ever disagreed with. I'm like, oh, you're totally yeah. right. This makes it so much better. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I've only worked with two editors. I was at uh, Simon & Schuster with my first book and then with Source Books with this one and had just had phenomenal experiences with both editors. Just, you know, um, and I think my first book had like a 20 page edit letter. And I think Shana sent me a 15 page edit letter for oh, wow. the last flight. I mean, yeah. but every single suggestion was like, oh yeah, okay, all right. You know, I mean, everything. And so for me, like the edit letter is, it's, it's not upsetting in the sense that like, you don't understand what I'm trying to do. It's not yeah. that. It's, it's, it's a little upsetting. overwhelming. Though. It's overwhelming and upsetting at the amount of work that <laughs> right. has to be done. Right. You know, right. Um, but it never, my experience also is that it never is as much work as it feels like at the beginning, right? You just right. pick a place and begin. And pretty soon you're not paying attention to how long it's going to take. You're just doing it. And then it's done. And then that wasn't so bad you know, yeah. if you, right. But you're, you know, you're pretty much stopping everything else for about a month. <laughs> yes. This and, is, yeah. And, and it's, you know, and there's something like I'll have, you know, I remember Anna just said once my, my edit letters aren't usually very long, but some of the comments are just very broad. Like I'm just feeling we need a subplot, <laughs> <I'm> like, oh, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no suggestion of like what to do, which is great. And you know, there'll be the reason I'd why. Like I like to, I mean, I always make a point of talking to my editor after the edit letter yeah. so that I can talk through stuff Yeah. because to me, that's really helpful to talk through. Okay. So we need a subplot. Like, what did you have in mind? Right. You know, like right. female, male, like, what are we doing here? Is it, you know, romantic relationship? Is it, you know, what's happening? Yeah. But I think that, I think that they do have an idea and even just the brainstorming. Yeah helps so so much 
So smart. Yeah, that's true. And to be fair, she's probably more specific than that on, on a lot of things. But uh, I'm, I'm a little bit the opposite where, you know, she will leave things very open yes. um, and say, hey, I'm totally here to talk. Yeah. And I get very much like, I don't want to brainstorm. I want to figure out this puzzle myself. Yeah. I want to come up with something. Say, yeah, I don't yeah. know why, but I, I feel like it's my responsibility. I'm like, oh, I'm supposed to do all this. Yeah. I don't know. But it's, yeah. I just got finished with edits for what's coming out next year. And then, you know, you get the second level of edits and it's like, it was, it's like nothing. And you're like, oh, okay. It's kind of done. Yeah. You know, this book is kind That's of done now. a scary now. moment too. You know, I don't. I did. I, I haven't read the last flight since we did yeah. last pages way back, and right. I don't even know when. Right over a year ago, um, and I had it. It was on um, Hank Philippi Ryan's first chapter, Fun, where she read yeah. the first yeah, yeah. chapter out loud, and I was watching. I watched it after it was recording because I was working while they did it. But I was like, oh. That's not bad, you know. I mean, because I'm always terrified. I'm I would read this book. I, I guess I could read that book. Yeah. I mean, I was. I'm always terrified that I'm going to hear something and be like, "What was I thinking? You know, why did I say it like that? Right. Well, that just sounded ridiculous. Why did you know? Why did I put a period there instead of a comma?" Yeah. So totally. you have to appreciate the good with the bad because I'll definitely have those moments. It's, for me, it's when I'm preparing to do a reading. Like I go, I do a lot of work to do a reading. I make sure yeah. it's very polished, yeah. and I'm going through stuff. And I will totally rewrite it. Oh, me too. I have in my, in my book that I, you know, it's take all marked up, reading, right? It's all marked up. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to switch that word out for this word. Like nobody. Right. Would know. Well, and you're editing for time a little bit too, because you want to, you only have mm -hmm. five minutes. You want to go to a certain place, but you're like, oh, there's a repeatable a word yeah. right there. That sounds yeah. ugly. Because you're yeah. reading out loud and you're catching so much more. That's why yeah. I can't even listen to the audio versions of my books. Oh, no. Me I, it freaks me yeah. out. Like, yeah. I've never, I've never, I've heard like a few sentences here and there, but that's just it. Yeah, no, I haven't either. Although I have to say, like, I get a lot of praise for my um, audio narrators. They, they did a fantastic job. And I so do too. I people, and people get attached to them. Yeah. 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 And you're just I'm thankful sure. that that's yes. awesome. Yeah. Well, listen, we're going we're gonna to make up a very short story. Okay. And I can see you're thrilled about this. I'll say, I know. No, it's usually a disaster, which, okay. is, the, All which right. is the best part of it. Um, so you're going to help me choose a book from behind me okay. and then a sentence, and then I'll read that sentence. And then you give me whatever you want, one or two sentences, and then we'll go back and forth, uh, okay. just crafting whatever we want. And All then right. I'll call it into it uh, okay. after a little bit. Um, so yeah, so let's pick a number, give me a number between one and three. Between one and three? Yeah. Well, there's only one between one and three, two. <laughs> <laughs> you can include one, two, or three. Okay, uh, two is fine. Okay, uh, and then one through seven. Uh, seven. And then let's say one through 10. I'm gonna say five. Okay, so that's gonna be the, uh, uh, the bookshelf, the column, and the number okay. of the book. So I'll be right back. Okay. This was given to me by a guy who's from my, uh, in my critique group at one of our Christmas events. The Beastly Beatitudes of uh, Balthasar B by J.P. Don Levy. Okay. Uh, um, so it's kind of a random book. Uh, so pick a page between one and 400. Okay, let's do 27. Okay, and then a sentence between one and three. So one of the first three sentences. Um, three. Okay. Ahead, the white cliffs and seagulls soared in the gray sky. Oh. <laughs> we can take as much time as we want. <laughs> Read it to me again. Okay. Uh, ahead, the white cliffs and seagulls soared in the gray sky. The sounds of the carnival behind me faded as I wandered into the dark. The dark of the circus tent, which was completely empty. All the revelers had gone for the night and it was just me standing on the straw floor. Scattered pieces of popcorn littered the ground and there was a doorway at the end of the tent where a sliver of light on. My feet scuffed along the ground as the stench of elephant feces filled my nostrils. 
I knew I had to go through this door, but I didn't know what was behind it. I hesitated before stepping through, knowing that once I entered, there may not be a way out. I walked through and it was immediately met by myself, not just myself, a thousand versions of myself, mirrors as far as I could see, all at different angles, reflecting me in shapes that seemed almost tormented. That Mickey Mouse shirt I decided to wear was a mistake. Mickey's face was distorted in almost what looked like terror. But as I moved, he became more cartoon-like and almost seemed to come to life. I stepped three feet forward and wasn't sure what direction was even available to me after that. And then the lights went out. I think we call it there. Okay. That's wonderful. <laughs> that, that was a little bit of the movie. Um, oh, now I'm going to forget the name of it where, where the, the kids are in um, the hall of mirrors at the circus. And it was really, really creepy. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't but that's that's fun, right? It's yeah, like, absolutely. I I love seeing. It. I usually get. What's gets... that book really about? What's that? What's that book really about? I never read it. You I don't know. Got you recording. I know. I know. Yeah. I never. I, I I never read it. Um. But yeah, it usually it usually gets. I've had a lot of thriller writers on, so it gets dark really fast. Um, but I'm having some romance writers and some nonfiction writers coming up. So we'll see, <laughs> we'll, see where, that. Yeah, we'll see exactly. where it goes. And the last thing I was going to bring up with you, just because it's, it's very interesting to me is, is thematically, again, something I think we're similar on. You seem to gravitate towards the idea of um, characters disappearing, yeah. which I've always been it's been a big thing for me and I don't know where that comes from in my life. <laughs> um, but I bought this book years ago, um, how to disappear, um, by Frank Ahern. And he's just an expert on, yeah, it's, it's probably dated. I don't know if, if it's, if they put out new editions, but it's like, Hey, you want to get rid of your, you know, digital footprint. This is how you do it. This is how you actually disappear. Because I, I, I love that idea of either starting over or, leaving a bad situation yeah. Um, yeah. and then how would you and then I love that idea and then I love the okay how would you actually do it because that's nothing you can take for granted you have to really know your shit to do this mm -hmm. what where do you think that comes from with with the last flight that idea is that something kind of that you you just like that almost romantic image of leaving it all behind Yes, I think definitely. And I also just think that everybody fantasizes about that, right? Like, right. Um, and I think the idea really started from when I read an Ann Tyler book, not a, a long time ago, Ladder of Years, which is a story of a mom who, and a wife, and she's got, you know, three kind of mostly grown children and a husband who completely takes her for granted. And they're on this beach vacation. And, um, you know, somebody left something back at the house and they're like, mom, will you go back and get it for me? And she's just like, I'm supposed to be on vacation, right? Like this is my vacation too. Yeah. And so she's like, fine, I'll go back and get it. And she starts walking back to the rental house or, and, and she just keeps walking. Like she's just done. She's so tired of feeling invisible and taken for granted. So she just keeps walking and she finds the small town and she has, you know, her wallet and her sandals and she just rents a room. She's just going to stay for the night, but she kind of just wants them to get a feel for like, what would have what would their life be like without her right and she kind of kind of plants some seeds in this new town and grows some roots there and starts <laughs> making friends she just kind of stays there you know uh, for a while and it's just i just was so intrigued by that i just my mind constantly goes back to that book all the time of just you know what does it take for somebody like at what point have you had enough right. that you're willing to do something like that you know Right. And then also, how do you create that character? What's that balance? Because you could very easily create a character where you start to lose sympathy for them. If, yes. they're, if they're, if they're being kind of leaving, like leaving your kids behind, that's yeah. a big deal, right? That's you can, why, you, that's you can why make it Claire work. didn't have any kids. Yeah. I mean, and that was one of the reasons why Claire didn't have any kids. And in fact, she didn't have any family at all because right. I felt like that would be a complication. It would be an interesting complication. Sure. Um, and certainly something that might have been a good thing to have her have, but 
um, when I was writing the book, I really had, I really wanted her to go in a certain way. And I knew that in order for that to work, um, I needed her to be with, with no strings attached, you know? Right. And, and there's also something about like, I think that could be an interesting challenge if they had to leave children. I don't yes. know if I'm good enough to write that. Some I don't know things. that I could write it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I think I could write it, but I think I'd hate myself and I think I'd hate my care. I don't know that I could write it in a way that would keep you sympathetic. Right. I mean, there, there are certainly some days I fantasize about it. Oh, well, yeah, <laughs> you know. That's funny. Well, listen, it was been awesome talking to you. And thank you for the blurb, by the way. Oh, sure. That's, You're very welcome. It was a great book. I'm looking um, forward to seeing everything happen for it. Well, I appreciate that. And congrats with all your success. That's just, it's so, it, it was fun kind of uh, digging into your past and, and learning about uh, your little career arc and everything. So I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing, sure. sharing your wisdom with me. So yeah, it was fun. All right. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks. I again. will. You too. Okay. Bye. So that was my conversation with Julie Clark. I really uh, had a great time talking to her and really appreciated the opportunity to get to know her a little bit better. And if you want to get to know her better, you can go visit her website at julieclarkauthor.com. And if you want to know more about me, my books, my upcoming events, or subscribe to my Pulitzer Prize winning newsletter, it's not really, you can go to carterwilson.com. More episodes of Making It Up out soon. In the meantime, thanks for listening and or watching. Take care.